Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Today I'm going to be featuring a build that is not mine. This build was brought by one of my players to a session I was running, and I was really impressed with the design and especially the results. So I asked the player if I could feature the build in the video, to which they agreed. So this build is called the Double Phantom, and it is actually a straight rogue. I mean, I see straight rogues in play here and there, and they can do fine, but very few I see excel. The Double Phantom is an exception, delivering damage I haven't seen from a rogue build before. And frankly, I was skeptical, and I did my own DPR calculations for this build, and found that the results achieved were almost identical to the DPR I calculate for this build. And I had to double check my work, because the numbers seem higher than they should be. But there they are. They're accurate. This build does amazing damage. If you think that taking a Battlemaster, Crossbow Expert Fighter is a great way to deliver reliable damage, we will blow those numbers away. This channel is supported by patrons. Thank you so much to all my patrons, but today I'd like to thank some of my top level patrons. David Lott, David W. Skibbins, Dewey Cheatham and Howe, Dia Michael 7000, Douglas Reynolds, Drew Terry, Ed Iverson, Eric Harvey, FBK05, Glenn Wilson, Gokamaru, Henry Eveleld, Horby, Ian Johnson, I'm Not K, Jay Gemmel, Jack Harper, James Mackla, James Sprague, James Thomas, Jason Klein, Jeff Williams, Jad Zan, John Matera, and Jonathan Lexi. Thank you all so much for your support. If you'd like to check out my Patreon, a link is in the video description. As we get started here, I just want to thank Raman Goblin, who created this build, and for the most part, I'm going to be presenting it as he has presented it to me. The exact results of the session, which the build was used, will also be presented. That was at level 9, and I'll be doing some DPR calculations of my own. I'm going to be presenting to you for level 9 and for level 20, and you'll see for yourself that the numbers here are really impressive. Raman Goblin was kind enough to write up an overview and a level-by-level -level guide to the build. Here is his overview for the Double Phantom. So the central purpose of the build was to make the most out of the only new optional feature which rogues receive from Tasha's, which is Steady Aim. That reads, at third level, as a bonus action, you give yourself advantage on your next attack roll on the current turn. You can use this bonus action only if you haven't moved during this turn, and after you use this bonus action, your speed is zero until the end of the current turn. So at first glance, this feature appears to give you a way to reliably deliver sneak attack damage at range in exchange for normally the excellent mobility that a rogue provides. A more careful reading reveals that this feature is not limited to ranged attacks, and it only impacts the player character's movement. Thus, this unlimited use feature can be combined with a mount, which means no sacrifice mobility, a way to disengage without cunning action, and a way to generate advantage every turn without relying on a stealth check for hide. This dependable source of advantage pairs excellently with elven accuracy. So I want to simply pair it here, that when your mount moves, that's not counted as your movement. You can have a movement speed of zero, and if you're mounted, that doesn't affect your mount's movement. The strategy of using steady aim every turn can be employed with any rogue and with any mount. However, having your bonus action committed to steady aim every turn conflicts with many roguish archetypes. The Arcane Trickster, Thief, Mastermind, and Soul Knife all rely on bonus actions. The other archetypes offer unneeded boosts to mobility, such as Scout or Swashbuckler, or alternate methods of sneak attacking, such as the Inquisitive or Swashbuckler. So all these features are redundant with this build. Thus, he believes the most synergetic archetype is the slow starting Phantom, whose ability to increase your sneak attack damage output has a no action cost and allies with the offensive boost established by Elven Accuracy. Choosing the Phantom archetype also creates a wonderful narrative synergy once you consider the most dependable source for a mount, the Phantom Steed Ritual. Since the steady aim interaction with Mounted Combatant is so central to this build, we don't want to rely on the DM making mounts available for purchase at the nearest town. Many adventuring scenarios occur away from civilization altogether, and even if you buy several mounts before setting off, 
it can be a challenge, if not impossible, to keep them alive and fed, or to get them where you need them. And thus we have our namesake, the Double Phantom. This is a rogue who has mastery over the souls of his enemies and a fleet of ghostly horses at his command. So quick overview in how this is going to work in gameplay. From levels 1 through 8, it's a rogue. It's pretty standard rogue play. Level 9 though is where things really start coming together and this is the level where I witness the build in action. I want to share the results now. So this is a damage based build and this is the round by round breakdown of actual game results. I always try to present DPR calculations on this channel but it's seldom I can provide actual results. In this case we had 12 rounds in combat. Before we get started, I just want to put in your heads that my baseline for damage for level 9 is 17.7. If you want to know about baseline damage, check the link in the video description. Meaning, I would expect any build that even partially relies on damage should do at least 17.7 .7 damage per round on average by level 9. I would expect an increase of uh, maybe 50% or so before I start considering damage to be good. and that would be about 27 points of damage per round. Before I start to consider damage excellent, I probably expect double baseline, so about 35 or 36 damage per round. Now, in the case of a crossbow expert fighter, I would expect about 30 points of damage per round at that level, so more than 50% increase over baseline. Not quite double, but close. In the session I ran, where the most common armor class was 19, we had a total of 12 rounds of combat. Here are the actual results from this build. On round one, 42 points of damage. Round two, 46 points of damage. Round three, 31 points of damage. Round four, 40 points of damage. Round five, somebody got the idea that this character was delivering a lot of damage. Wonder what haste would do for it. Well, haste went on, 71 points of damage. And then on round 6, also with haste, 91 points of damage. And then round 7, 54 points of damage. And then the haste was gone for round 8, 48 points of damage. This was the character's only critical hit in the session. That was below average. This character should have probably gotten two critical hits, only got one. Round 9, 47 points of damage. Round 10, 25. Round 11, 23. And then round 12, they got haste again, 55 points of damage. That's a total of 573 points of damage over 12 rounds, or 47.75 damage per round. Once again, the DPR for this level, 17.7. What we'd expect a crossbow expert fighter to do, about 30. We're way, way over that. Now, there was haste involved, so we got to wonder about that. Never mind how luck might have played within these numbers. I can tell you that the DPR numbers match these results. They show these results are no fluke. They're completely supported by the math. When we get to level 9, I'll go through the DPR. And I just have to say, I never would have expected a full rogue to be achieving these kinds of results. So let's get into the build. First, race. We're committed to an elf race for elven accuracy. So Raman Goblin is going to recommend that we take the high elf or a half elf variant with high elf magic in order to get the booming blade cantrip. This is a rare damage build which never gets extra attack so booming blade is an excellent choice that fits with our theme of scaling. They recommend keeping perception proficiency and taking elvish and undercommon azure racial languages. Raman Goblin suggests switching the plus one intelligence to constitution. Of course, if you do half elf, you'll want to do the plus two charisma to dexterity. He has also used the Tasha's options to switch some origin proficiencies to grab heavy crossbow, whip, forgery kit, and land vehicles. The background is not important. He recommends the haunted one in order to add to the edgy theme. He suggests taking arcana and survival proficiency, and for languages, abyssal and infernal. After all, this character is dealing with the souls of some unsavory individuals. Any languages work, since eventually Comprehend Languages is going to be in play. They used ability scores using point buy with the plus two decks and plus one con racial bonuses. That had them end up with a strength of eight, dexterity of 17, constitution 14, intelligence 10, wisdom 15, and charisma 10. Okay, so that is the starting character. 
Levels 1 through 2. This is standard rogue fare. You start with the rapier and a crossbow. And what you're going to do is you're going to upgrade to heavy crossbow when you can. And then you start with leather armor and you want to upgrade to studded leather when you can. For skills, he recommends stealth, acrobatics, insight, and investigation. He recommends expertise in perception and any other skill of your choice, he chose investigation. Perhaps stealth if your party favors those tactics and you don't have pass without trace. Note that cunning action, which is normally one of the best features a rogue gets, will eventually never be used for this character. Okay, so level three. We get it, steady aim. At this point, this character really wants to grab a mount if they can. Feel free to name it, get attached, because if it dies, we can always summon it as a ghost later in the campaign. From the Phantom Archetype of Rogue, we get some skill and tool flexibility from Whispers of the Dead, and we get what will become a good feature for our damage, Whales from the Grave. Now, currently at level 3, it's twice per long rest. That is painfully limited. Note this damage is not single target, can't crit, and is only on your turn. Now, when I do DPR calculations later, you'll note that Whales of the Grave is not included in critical damage. That's why. However, this is a reliable damage type and has no saving throw. As long as you can see the second target and it's within 30 feet of the creature you attacked, the Whales bypass any defenses, such as a high armor class or mirror images. Bombing Goblin recommends saving it for a creature that you know only has a few hit points left. This saves you from wasting a bunch of your sneak attack damage on a creature that would have died from any hit. This allowed Ramen Goblin to often kill two creatures in the same turn with a single attack. You can also try to use it to break concentration of a mage who you can't reliably attack. Fortunately, this feature scales in number of uses and effectiveness as our sneak attack dice increase. On to level 4. The choice here for ability score increase is obviously Elven Accuracy. Not only does it round out our dexterity to 18, it turns our advantage into super advantage. So, a couple things here. Uh, first, our crit chance is going to increase from about 10% to about 14%, but mainly we're really reducing our miss chance. We're making one attack per round. We want it to hit every single round, and we will get to the point where it is pretty much hitting every single round. Now, one might wonder if this character is going to be using a heavy crossbow, if it should consider Sharpshooter. Sharpshooter makes the damage far less reliable and lowers it. It's not worth taking. Levels 5 through 7. This is your standard rogue fare, and worse levels for the build relative to what other characters can do. All rogues struggle at these levels, and with only three uses of Whales of the Graves, your subclass isn't helping you as much as other rogues. For expertise, he recommends insight, since he will soon be asking questions of the dead and another of your choice. He recommends acrobatics to protect against being grappled. At level 8, we're now adding our second phantom by taking Ritual Caster. This one came from left field for me. I did not expect a rogue who takes Ritual Caster rather than increasing their dexterity or a feat to somehow improve weapon attacks could possibly be effective, but this really works here. Ramen Goblin says he figures it's a highly underutilized feat for martial classes and that people rate it decently, but he hardly sees it on builds. This feat gives the utility that marshals lack outside of killing things. Combined with your excellent skills, you should have a solid role outside of combat. With rituals like detect magic, comprehend languages, which he says is good for talking to spirits, unseen servant, good for being a ghost, Ooh water breathing, tiny hut, and eventually telepathic bond. He suggests working with your DM to see how you can gain access to these spells. At this level, you should have enough money and connections to buy spell scrolls of the most important rituals as long as they're available. The two preeminent rituals you need to take are Phantom Steed and Find Familiar. Phantom Steed gives you unlimited mounts who can combo with your steady aim to keep you mobile and at a safe distance. Find Familiar has a million uses but it can serve as a backup plan if your mount dies and you need to set up advantage while continuing to move, such as moving to mount your backup phantom steed. He flavored his owl as another ghost friend, which fit with their flyby ability. Okay, so level 9. Uh, first off, if you want to see the build at this level, the link is in the video description. 
It all comes together with Tokens of the Departed. This ability has defense, utility, and offense. It gives you advantage on constitution saves and death saves, allows you to interrogate enemies without grisly scenes of torture, and effectively, it makes your Whales of the Graves an infinite resource. Ramen Goblin was pleased to find he never ran out of soul trinkets and never even needed to dip into his per long rest uses of Whales of the Grave. So he finished this session with every use of Whales of the Grave still available, even though he used it whenever it was available in combat. And that's because it just so happens you're going to be slaying about a creature per round, especially with the excellent damage this character build provides. You also have Ready Souls to Harvest, since you took Ritual Caster. Because, now, this is rather gruesome, but if you need more soul trinkets, you can get them, what you have to do is you have to slay your phantom steeds, who qualifies creatures to fill up your trinkets. It's the classic bag of rats gimmick, and you should check with your DM and make sure they are comfortable with it. I'm going to quickly go over how the tactics work for this character. Okay, so uh, in this case we're fighting some death slots. There's three death slots. We've been in combat with them. Uh, we can see one's a little bit damaged, one's very damaged, that's the one we've been kind of concentrating on, and one is undamaged. We can see that the double phantom is well back of everyone else, and that is the way we want it to be. Uh, so we've got maybe a couple melee characters going at it, and maybe a couple other ranged characters. Now we'll be able to maintain a greater range than the other ranged characters, uh, because we are using the phantom steed. Uh, so on our turn, what we want to do is we want to move in, and we want to move into the point where we're like within 30 feet of the enemy. Uh, so that's uh, around here, I guess. Uh, and normally you would target the one that has the most damage. So this one here is almost dead. That would normally be the target that would be the optimal choice. In this case, because we are using a double phantom, uh, it actually is not our optimal choice. We'd be much better off choosing a different target, shooting it with our heavy crossbow, doing the massive damage to that one, and then using Whales of the Grave to automatically wipe this one out. Uh, so this one will die, we can now fill it soul token, and this one here is going to take massive damage. So we've taken out one and done a nice job starting out on another one, despite the fact we only have a single attack. Now, our steed at this point has used less than half its movement, uh, and it doesn't need to disengage because it isn't in melee, so it could even dash. Uh, 200 feet of movement if we do that, so this map isn't big enough. We can go much further back than that. Uh, so now on these turns, the death slots will probably attack the melee characters, but one of them could, if they wanted, lob a fireball and still get to us. If they did that, then remember that we have a good dexterity saving throw. In fact, it's by far our best at save and evasion. So we're likely going to take no damage from it. It's unlikely that that would be their choice, but they could kill the Phantom Steed. Uh, now, if they do, depending on the positioning of the other Phantom Steed and cover and such, what we may be able to do on our turn is actually do movement and then mount a second Steed. Uh, and then we could use our familiar to come in and give us advantage using the help action, then move in again, do the same thing again. Now remember, to get advantage, what we're doing is we're using steady aim, that's reducing our movement speed to zero, and as long as we're mounted at the start of our turn, that's no problem at all, we weren't moving anyways. Uh, but if for some reason our steed dies, then we will need another way to get advantage. The familiar is the best way to do that. This, of course, is an open map. Ideally, there's some kind of corner we could turn around, get full cover, uh, and then we wouldn't even have to worry about the fireballs. But even on an open map, just because of the outright speed of the Phantom Steed, we can still often get to safety. Uh, just keep in mind, this is a creature that we're fighting that happens to have a really long ranged area of effect damage spell. Uh, if we're fighting something that doesn't have that, then it's going to have no way to hurt us or our steed. There are some additional tactical considerations. So you need to have a free hand to absorb a soul into a trinket, and you need to be within 30 feet of the dying creature. This is no problem if you're using a heavy crossbow, just ride your steed within 30 feet of the target you're attacking, or finishing it off with Whales of the Grave. You need to be more careful when attempting to make a rapier attack and disengaging with your steed. Though this seems like free extra booming blade damage, 
a hundred feet of movement might not be enough to run to a safe location. And now you're holding a crossbow in one hand and a rapier in the other. If a creature dies any time during that round, you won't be able to use a free hand to conjure a soul trinket. He recommends only pulling out your rapier if you know that creatures are not about to die, or if you know you won't need any more trinkets in the adventuring day, or if you think that booming blade secondary damage is going to seriously inconvenience your enemy. It should take your object interaction on your turn to stow soul trinkets. So if you sheathe your rapier before you shoot and kill a creature with your crossbow, you're going to have to hold the trinket until the next round when you can safely stow it. He has a role play suggestion here. He says, when you use your reaction to suck the spirit out of a dying creature, say, your soul is mine. Okay, so this is the level where we saw those results I presented at the beginning of the video. If you're wondering, was it luck? Well, let's do the math. Okay, so this uses my standard method of uh, calculating DPR, and our chance to hit is actually really, really good. We're using steady aim, uh, and we have elven accuracy. Now, normally at level 9, I am calculating against an armor class of 18, uh, which is how I work out my standard baseline for this level. So we have a plus 8 to hit, so here's how it goes. We need at least a 10 to hit, so 1 to 9 misses, or normally 45% of our attacks. Except we have advantage, so 45% goes down to 20%. Except we have elven accuracy, so 20% goes down to 9%. Uh, yeah, so 91% chance to hit. And then we got to look at our chance to crit. Uh, with elven accuracy, it's about 14.2%. Our base weapon damage is a d10, or 5.5 on average. We're going to add 4 from dexterity. We're going to add 17.5 from sneak attack. And we're going to add 10.5 from whales from the grave. So that's 37.5 times 91% equals 34. Critical hit is going to add 23 damage on average. Then we need to multiply that by the 14.2% of the time. This gives us our total DPR for the heavy crossbow, 37. That is over twice my baseline. Now, what if we used a rapier and booming blade? Well, base weapon damage is a d8, or 4.5 on average, 4 from dexterity, 17.5 from sneak attack, 4.5 booming blade primary damage, another estimated 4.5 average secondary damage, 10.5 from whales from the grave, so that's 45.5 times 91% chance to hit, equals 41.4, uh, but our critical hits now actually add a bit more. A critical hit would be 27.5 on average, 14.4% of the time. This gives us a total DPR of 45.3. That is a 157% over baseline. So we're talking more than double baseline, getting, getting close to triple baseline. Now, the actual damage done by this build is 47.75 during the uh, session that I ran, and there were a few rounds of haste to boost damage. So, this really lines up with the math I did. This shows me that the DPR calculations are pretty close. Now, let's put this into context. If you're a Battle Master fighter with level 9, sharpshooter, crossbow expert, hand crossbow, I expect around 30 points of damage per round. Now, I should say about 10 points of damage from Whales to the Grave is to a second target. Sometimes this is an advantage, but not always. But even if we completely disregard secondary damage, we're out damaging the Crossbow Expert Battlemaster for single target damage. And then that secondary damage is just gravy on top of that. So, again, if you want to see this character sheet, I've linked it in the video description for level 9 and a theoretical level 20. So that is what I saw in gameplay. That's the math. Here are Ramen Goblin's recommendations for levels 10 through 20. Now, if you think 157% of damage over baseline is good damage, just wait until we get to level 17. We are going to see damage that is approaching triple the baseline. Uh, just a tiny bit shy. I'll go over the math when we get there. So, level 10, he recommends maxing dexterity at this point. Now, normally a build suffers offensively when it takes two feats without very inhuman or custom lineage. 
However, elven accuracy and the fact that we make only one attack means that dexterity does less for this character than most builds in terms of straight offense. The most important reason to increase dexterity is to improve the lousy armor class of 16 to 17 and improve our initiative score by 1. Levels 11 and 12. Reliable talent synergizes with our floating proficiency from Whisper of the Dead. We get a substantial damage boost from sneak attack and booming blade scales at the same time. So at this point, it might be tempting to switch to using a rapier as your primary weapon. Now, while your personal defense will improve at level 13, your phantom steed is still very vulnerable. If you commit to rapier and booming blade, you won't be able to switch back to heavy crossbow on a round by round basis because of the two added property. Rapier and hand crossbow would run into loading issues. So if you opt for this more aggressive offensive strategy, just be prepared to occasionally lose your steed because you can't create enough distance. The most straightforward ability score increase recommendations from now on are to increase constitution or maybe take the lucky feat. However, he is recommending the shadow touch feat for 12th level. It rounds out the character to a 16 wisdom and fits excellently into the grim dark theme. For the first level spell, he recommends silent image. There aren't many other strong options and silent image has the occasional out of combat utility that works well with a once per long rest casting and the idea that we're creating a scene with our ghostly powers. The real reason to take this feat is combining invisibility with our 13th level ability, which will be discussed when we talk about level 13. He mentions some other possible feats if you want to go a different direction. Since your constitution saves already have advantage, you could take the tough feat for some pure hit points. With reliable talent, the rarely picked skilled feat maybe is a consideration. And if you're electing to use the rapier exclusively, you might consider the mounted combatant feat. The first benefit, advantage on melee attacks against creatures smaller than the mount, is not very useful because you already have permanent advantage. The problem with the mounted combatant feat, it might seem obvious since we're going to be mounted pretty much all the time, but it, it has a lot of redundancies. First, it's going to give you advantage on melee attacks against creatures smaller than the mount, and that's not useful because you basically already have permanent advantage and we've avoided features that could utilize a free bonus action. The third benefit, giving evasion to our mount, is not very useful because this is a riding horse and has a plus zero dexterity save, so advantage probably isn't going to allow it to save anyways. However, the second benefit of forcing attacks against the mount to target the rider could be very useful and has no action or resource cost. It could potentially allow a dash rather than a disengage with the mount if we eat one opportunity attack from the enemy we're targeting. And we could suffer one attack of opportunity since we don't concentrate on spells and since at level 13 the defense against attacks significantly improves. So let's talk about level 13. Once again, a lot happens here. Ghost Walk has amazing flavor, is a huge defensive buff on a character that needs better defense, and turns the character into the best scout reconnaissance character in the game. Like Whales of the Grave, this can become an effective always-on feature through the use of soul trinkets. The 10 minute duration might already last until our next short rest, when we can replenish soul trinkets by killing phantom steeds. Permanent, uninterruptible disadvantage to all attacks against us is well worth one soul trinket especially considering our proficiency increased to plus 5 at this level. The first tactical note Raman Goblin makes is that this feature does not interfere with what we're already doing. It says we can move through creatures and objects, so we can still interact with everything as normal. Most importantly, our mount. For most combats, we'll ignore the 10 foot fly speed and just zoom around with 200 foot dash speed of our steed. In fact, the hover ability synergizes with Mountain Combatant, since now we won't suffer falling damage and prone condition from being knocked off the horse. Second, while permanent disadvantage to be hit is obviously really strong, it also creates a cool and unique vibe combined with a character who already has permanent advantage to hit. Despite not adding advantage to dexterity saves, he would argue that this is stronger than getting a free dodge action every turn because the disadvantage to be hit isn't going to go away if you're incapacitated or grappled. Third, if you have another method of generating advantage, such as Mounted Combatant, you might consider using a bonus action dash 
and your fly speed to sink through your horse and the floor to avoid being able to be targeted at all in the upcoming round. Taking a d10 force damage instead is nothing. But make sure to check with your DM if your ability to move through creatures would allow you to avoid the dismounting reduction to your speed. On your next turn, assuming your steed is alive, you should take 5 feet to fly out of the ground next to your steed and your remaining 5 feet to mount your steed. You can even make ground peaking your primary strategy, especially if you took stealth as expertise. Now you can effectively have cover to bonus action hide behind anywhere there's a floor. Just another way you can have permanent advantage to hit. Finally, he just wants to repeat how good this ability makes you at scouting. With an hour long invisibility spell, you can effectively turn into an arcane eye that can hear, grab things, pass through solid barriers, and even talk sass to confuse guards. Maybe even spook them. While 10 feet flying sounds slow, remember you can triple dash for 30 feet per round, which is just as fast as an arcane eye can move. The only thing that might stop this unlimited range reconnaissance is a creature which has true sight or a barrier made from a spell effect other than an object. Then we get into levels 14 through 16. This is standard rogue fare. Sneak attack is scaling and 46 from Whales of the Grave since 13th level. Blind sense might combo with ghost walking inside of walls and depending on your DM's ruling may prevent this character from having disadvantage on invisible creatures. Going strictly by rules as written, you are still attacking an unseen creature and still have disadvantage. The designers have conflicting rulings on how the feature is supposed to work with rules as intended. Slippery Mind grants Wisdom Save Proficiency, which is excellent. Never mind the fact this character already has a strong Wisdom, so Wisdom Saves are really strong. Now Ramen Goblin took Mounted Combatant here, though Lucky is probably more generally useful. Then we get to level 17. Now we're increasing our already excellent single target damage by 5d6, while our damage to a second target increases by 1d6. And if we're favoring our rapier, Booming Blade also scales by a d8 for the initial and the proccing damage. This incredible spike makes me wonder if there are any other builds which deal higher sustained damage. Surely many can deliver bigger bursts on the first round, but we'll keep hitting and hitting, likely never running out of Whales of the Grave, unless the enemy finds a way to close the distance we're keeping with Phantom Steed, and decides to focus on us with disadvantage rather than focusing on the 17th level casters in our party. Now I have to say the damage here is incredible. So basically at level 17, when we use Whales of the Grave, which is all the time, then basically we're adding the 5d6 Whales from the Grave damage to our sneak attack damage. So that's just extra damage on that single target. Uh, and I'll show you when we get to level 20 how insane damage gets here. You thought level 9 was good? Wait till you see level 20. So the three final levels of Rogue are not as exciting, but they still offer enough that Ramen Goblin is not recommending multiclassing. Sneak attack scales to 10d6. You get to pick up the last ability score increase. He took Lucky, uh, though he said you know, those other suggestions he made would still be a good idea. At level 20, you get the Rogue Capstone, which is, frankly, pretty lackluster. Better than any of those, in his opinion, is Elusive, which is gained at level 18, which protects our disadvantage to be hit. So, Elusive, starting at 18th level, you are so evasive that attackers rarely gain the upper hand against you. No attack roll has advantage against you while you aren't incapacitated. Since... We're dealing serious damage every turn. Enemies are going to want to focus on this character and are going to try to generate advantage. To try to hit this character, if they can, it's going to be difficult. So using my damage calculations, Battlemaster Crossbow Expert can achieve a maximum DPR of 52 at 20th level. I've seen in the higher 50s sometimes uh, that is based on an easier chance to hit, um, but you know it is never above 60. Let's see how the double phantom compares. So using my DPR method at level 20, we should be expecting armor class 20. That gives us a 60% chance to hit, but we have double advantage. So that improves to 94% chance to hit. So we should hit almost all the time. Rapier is doing the most damage now, but let's start with our heavy crossbow. So it's a D10 or 5.5 plus five from dex, plus 35 from sneak attack, 
plus another 35 from whales from the grave, 17.5 to the primary target, 17.5 to a secondary target. That's 80.5 times our chance to hit, that's 75.7 damage, plus an extra 40.5 from criticals, and that's over 14% of the time. Total DPR, 81.5 damage. Or we could use our rapier if we want to deliver the most damage. That's 4.5 rapier damage, plus 5 dexterity, plus 35 sneak, plus 35 whales of the grave, again, 17.5 primary, 17.5 secondary, 13.5 from booming blade, plus 9 on average, secondary, that's 102.5 damage, and that becomes 98.4 after our chance to hit, but then we add up to 53 extra damage on a critical hit, or I should say an average of 53 extra damage on a critical hit, 14.2% of the time. That gives us a total DPR of 105.9. That is more than twice what we would get if we were using a hand crossbow battle master fighter. Uh, in fact, it's more than that fighter would do delivering an action surge, except we're not using an action surge. We can do this every single round. And that is a single attack per round. No extra attack. Uh, I, you know, I just can't believe it, but the math is there, right there in front of you. Now, Ramen Goblin has done his own calculations. In fact, I'm going to link the Google Sheet that he sent me with the write-up for this character that I have largely used to present it here to you now. Uh, so if you want to check that out, that is also linked in the video description, and you can see another method to calculate damage that he uses. And you know what? Let's take away the secondary target damage. You know how much the secondary target damage is? About 17 and a half. So if we take that 17 and a half away, for a single target, we're still looking at over 88 damage per round on average. Again, our baseline is 35, and our Battlemaster is doing 52. So we're like 36 damage over Battlemaster. It's basically like taking Battlemaster, Crossbow Expert, Sharpshooter damage, then add the baseline on again, and that's how much we're doing to a single target. So this isn't just about splitting damage against a single target, this is delivering, and then it's doing damage to a secondary target, and that is extra damage above excellent damage already. So yeah, the damage here is surprising, and it did. It bore out in actual gameplay, I mean, almost exactly. Now, I am always excited to see a build work well, but to see a build where it's a straight rogue and out damaging everything... That makes this, I think, the best straight 20th level rogue build I have seen to date. I would have never predicted a ritual caster rogue to be out damaging crossbow fighters, never mind by dramatic amounts. But there it is. I hope you have enjoyed the Double Phantom. Thanks again to Ramen Goblin for allowing me to share it. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.